Hi, everyone. Welcome to Co-Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Sarah Boston, and we have a pretty incredible episode today. Uh, my guest is Kelly Dunham. She's not the gym teacher. She's not a 12-year-old boy, but she is a lot of other things. We were saying she has a lot of niche or niche eye. I'm not really sure how to say that, but uh, she was raised an evangelical Christian on a dairy farm. Uh, her humble beginnings in comedy were telling jokes to cows who are actually not the worst audience members, and I can definitely attest to that. She then became a nurse. She did a lot of community nursing, and she's part of the queer community. She has used her nursing to help educate healthcare professionals about the LGBT community. She's also suffered grief in her life and has found ways to use art to kind of work through that and laughter uh, to work through that. And she's teaching other people how to do the same thing. She teaches about laughter at the end of life. Just an amazing chat. And I learned a lot. Uh, I learned about how to ask for help and how to give help to people that need help. There's just a lot in this talk. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I like to start with people's origin stories and talk about their career in medicine. You have such an interesting career and such an interesting origin story. So wherever you want to start, you're a nurse. You were almost a nun or close to being a nun. You did training in that. And you're a comedian and a performer and an author. So I almost don't know where to start. But why don't we start with kind of your origins in potentially becoming a nun and in nursing? I met the missionaries of charity, the kind of nun I became. I didn't even grow up Catholic. I grew up evangelical Christian. I met the missionaries of charity when I was volunteering at a school for kids with disabilities in Port-au-Prince, Haiti in the late 80s, which was right after the Duvaliers left. And uh, politically, things were just a mess. And so the kids who were at the school were from the provinces. After a bomb went off like 100 yards from the school, they sent the kids back home to the provinces for the rest of the semester. And so I'm just going to kicking around the school with not any real tangible way to help anyone. And so there's an American dentist who was visiting. He's like, oh, hey, why don't you come with me to the Home for the Dying? Such a lovely name for a hospice, a uh, very blunt name anyway. So I went with him. So I met the missionaries of charity there and kind of fell in love with what they were doing. And it's funny because when people ask me about, of course, I have complicated feelings about Catholicism and you know, nuns as part of a colonizing force. But compared to a lot of like the regular missionary people in Haiti, most of the nuns are uh, folks of color, mostly from the global south. They were actually doing pretty different work. Well, I wouldn't say it was mutual aid by anyone's estimation, but there were some things that were very egalitarian about it. I love that the sisters lived in in community. Yeah. So I you know, developed a big crush on all of them. I'll say it wasn't just one nun, it was all of them. And I thought that the school would start like, you know, it was supposed to start by Christmas, didn't start by Christmas. I thought it'd start by March, didn't start by March. So like after eight months, I was kind of like, I think I should be a sister. I think this is what I'm supposed to do. Anyway, so I volunteered with them. I converted to Catholicism. I remember the first time I mentioned it to a parish priest, he was like, uh, oh, well, it doesn't usually go that way. No idea how to convert from being a born again Christian to being Catholic. Anyway, so it took me a while to do that. And you can't just convert one day and then become a nun the next yet they make you wait a little bit. So I volunteered with them uh, a few different places before I became a nun. And I knew their work really well. And there's things about their work that I have a lot of ambivalence towards. And there were like lovely parts of the work and parts of the work that I thought actually might potentially make the world a better place. But uh, I didn't really know a lot about their inner convent life. And that was the part that just didn't work for me. And I would say, me did not work for them either. Like they had this very strict idea of obedience, you know, and like we'd come home from working all day in the soup kitchen and they would say today, sisters, because we love Jesus, we're going to move all the furniture from the dorm into the dining room and the dining room into the dorm. Uh, we were just supposed to say, yes, sister. Thank you, sister. Uh, anyway, and that's not what I said in response to those kind of moments. So they said that I had insufficient docility. And so anyway, all that's to say that took actually, even though I wasn't, a, you know, I was a nun for less than two years, it took up a large portion of my 20s. It was clearly not going well. I kept getting held back as a, an aspirant. You know, I kept failing and, and there was no social promotion. And this was long before this was kind of a thing that everybody was doing. Uh, we used non-disposable menstrual product, uh, which ended up just being a diaper that we folded and put in our underwear. And also we washed them out by hand, right? I think my body was just like, get out. 
<laughs> so we kind of committed Amityville horror and I just bled for like four months. And we were cleaning the women's shelter and there was a tampon up on top of one of the chest of drawers. And I took it and I put it in my little nun pocket. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to borrow this. And then as I was walking away, I was like, I'm not borrowing this. I'm not going to bring it back. And then I was like, okay, this, I knew this situation wasn't making me happy, but this is clearly, it wasn't making me holy because I maybe didn't know who I wanted to be, but I know I didn't want to be somebody who stole a tampon from an unhoused person. And then that seemed like, okay, this is so, yeah, my mistress just took me to Port Authority, you know, tapping her little foot, you know, she's like, where do you want to go? And I was like, well, I thought this was the end of the line. I thought I was going to be a nun for the rest of my life, you know? So, but luckily my sister lived in Philadelphia and uh, I just kind of showed up at her door. Uh, in my dress that had been wadded up in the attic at the convent for two years. And then I knew I needed to do something. And so I went back to school. I hadn't finished my undergraduate degree, luckily, because I was able to get a great full scholarship to go to nursing school. So I got my associate's degree and stayed at the same school and finished my bachelor's degree. And that was like the best thing I did for myself. I feel so, so, so grateful for that. It's so flexible and I also just love like love being a nurse, you know, that's like definitely where my heart is. That's an amazing story. <laughs> OK, I'm going to pivot like about six times, I think, because your story just because your story pivots, too. <laughs> so you kind of got on the path of nursing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about nursing and kind of the. I know you've done a lot of different things within nursing, but let's talk about some of the jobs you've had as a nurse. I only worked in the hospital for a little bit after I left. Uh, hospital nursing is I mean, it's not just hard. I feel like it's almost impossible. I really admire hospital nurses so much. But there's a nurse managed health center that was starting in at the request of the community in North Philadelphia. So I was the first primary care nurse then. So that was like, you know, doing primary care nurse. And <laughs> that was around the time they started making the hepatitis immunizations required for like seventh graders. And so I spent so many days like walking around with hepatitis immunizations in my backpack, immunizing people like in the you know, housing projects where we were, you know, just a lot of like community based nursing. But, you know, we also did primary care there. And that was an amazing job. I loved that job. We just kind of were developing it from scratch. We were sharing a space with in a recreation center that also had a summer camp or an after school program. I remember one time the director of the, <laughs> the camp came running through with a box and he's holding up a spectrum. And he's like, I opened up this box, but I think it belongs to you guys. And I was like, yes, I do believe that that is for us and not the camp. So that was my very first job, which was fantastic. I'm still really close to those folks. Like my first boss was Patty Garrity. He was kind of a, you know, famous, a famous nurse uh, as nurses go. And I'm going to her wedding. Uh, she's getting remarried at it's like 75 or something like that uh, oh, next wow. week. Yeah. So I'm still really wow. close with those folks. That was my first job. And then I worked as a nurse family partnership nurse, which is a home visiting program for first time new moms. And that was tremendous. I love doing home visiting nursing. Yeah, I did that job for a decade on public transportation. Um, they hadn't had anyone nationwide who'd, who'd done it that long on public transportation, but I actually really liked it. That was an amazing job. And I really appreciate the vulnerability of people who led us into their houses. I found that really uh, touching and profound, the trust that that takes to let somebody come to your house for two years. You know, it's a two-year program. I've done uh, assorted other things, helping people build caregiver teams now. I do some home health as well. And I also worked in the school system for a while. And a lot of what I do with nurses now is I do workshops and presentations on using humor in nursing. In fact, just last night, the night before, I did a virtual presentation to the Minnesota Hospice and Palliative Care Nurses Association on called Laughter at the End of Life. So it's a conversation about, yeah, I mean, laughter at the end of life, uh, which it's a hilarious to talk with hospice nurses about that because they are already the experts. But it was a really interesting conversation about what the research says and how can you train your skills? And whenever I do that, a lot of people will come and be like, yeah, when patients are very, very ill, patients and families all use humor, but nobody has taught us how to interact and what's positive and what's not positive and what's constructive and not so. So that's some of the stuff that I'm working on now. That sounds like a combination of almost <laughs> everything that you've done. Yeah. So we will definitely get into that. But how did you start doing comedy and getting into comedy? I always wanted to be a comedian, like when I was a kid, as soon as I knew that that was a thing that somebody could be, you know, my dad let me stay up late to watch the Steve Martin special. And even though I would say like my comedy is nothing like Steve Martin, 
And I can't believe as a kid, I, I mean, a lot of his comedy is so, it's goofy. So I guess there is that side that kids are like, but it's also very surreal. So I don't know exactly what attracted me to it. Maybe the arrow through the head or something, even though I can't imagine doing an arrow through my head thing on stage. But so I always knew that, that I used to tell jokes to the cows as I walked home from school, which that sounds like, you know, a made up story, but that's actually true. A fable. It sounds like I just told a, a fable about myself. So I always knew I wanted to do that. To get good at stand-up comedy, you got to be bad at stand-up comedy in front of people. And I didn't have the confidence to do that until my late 20s. When I was in nursing school, there were two gay papers in Philadelphia. Now there's barely one, you know. The, the idea that there's two gay papers in a metropolitan area is just, that's a different time. But anyway, so I wrote a weekly humor column called Trippin' Out that was 500 words long. It was for print, so it had to be within like 20 words of 500 words. Uh, it had to be funny, had to be gay, and also it had to do with the theme of the newspaper that week. It was always themed. Uh, so, you know, on Wednesday night, I'd be calling my friends, uh, can you think of anything funny and gay about the Devon Horse Show? <laughs> you know, But that was excellent. That was such good training. You know, it was like writing boot camp. So I was writing funny stuff, but I wasn't really performing it. I had done a couple open mics and had terrible times like in my mid-20s before I started nursing school. Coming out of nursing school is kind of what gave me the confidence to be like, if I survived, you know, not knowing how to get a patient's uh, side rails down or like, you know, the first time I went to give heparin, you know, and the guy didn't have an umbilicus, which I felt like was like almost like, oh, who's going to punk the nursing student? If I can get through that, then I can get through comedy. Yeah. So I started performing stand-up comedy. I was performing, trying to perform in the clubs in Philadelphia. There was an open mic in the basement of a hotel in northeast philadelphia you know when we could all still smoke inside it would be so smoky and the guys would just get up and goad each other into telling rape jokes i mean rape jokes there wasn't even a joke about it usually it was just like you know it's just an excuse i don't know if, if you can really call that comedy when it's just an excuse for recently divorced men to get drunk and say terrible things about their wives uh, i used to start my comedy with i need you to ignore all the visual cues you're getting right now and believe that I'm an adult female and not a 12-year-old boy. A guy, one of the comics on the front row was like, oh, you're not a 12-year-old boy. You're just a big, fat, ugly dyke. And before wow. you know, my brain could engage with my mouth, I said, oh, you're just sad. I'm not a 12-year-old boy. You and the Catholic priest both. And that was hitting him way too hard for how he hit me. And he chased me uh, in the parking lot with a broken bottle after the show. And I was like, you know, as I was running away, I was like, I think I need to get better at running away or I need to find different places to perform. Uh, and so I started performing really almost specifically in the queer community. You know, it's such a great way to get so much stage time at once because anything that happened, I would offer to MC it. Oh, do you need an MC for that? Oh, a dog show? Can I MC that? You know, uh, and I started performing at Pride, which also, you know, like uh, within three years, I MC'd Atlanta Pride and that was four days in a row. And by the end of the four days, I was like, and now give it up for, and I would have totally forgotten who was coming on, you know, because I was so tired. But anyway, that was a great, also a great boot camp. I mean, I never really thought that I would have opportunities kind of beyond the community. And I was okay with that because I felt like, oh, I was feel, I felt grateful to have the chance to perform for my community. Um, but meantime, the world changed and uh, people became more open to queer stories and hearing about queer life as part of comedy. So and also like kind of the overlap, it ended up being people often expect comedians to be kind of, I don't know, callous and terrible and loose cannons, I think is the word uh, I'm looking for, the phrase I'm looking for. And I'm not that, you know, I call myself a trauma informed comedian. I get a lot of work talking to like the National Association of Victims, Advocates and Corrections, like people who really need to laugh and probably are already making themselves laugh. But that ends up being a little bit of my niche, too, which I feel super grateful for. Yeah, it feels like you've got a bunch of niches. Is that <laughs> niche? I? Yeah. Niche? Yeah. I? I don't know what the plural of niche is. I should know. Yeah, I can definitely relate to some of the comedy experiences. Not quite as harsh as what you described, but definitely sometimes doesn't feel like a, a safe place for female comedians. No one ever chased me with a, a beer bottle, though. But that is so definitely understand that feeling a need for safety or a need for other places to perform. You've also done. I can't remember how many. I'm sorry, but you'll have to you'll have to tell me how many one person shows have you performed? There's a way to make your hour of comedy into a narrative arc and call it a one person show. Yeah, I have a bunch of one of one person shows. You know, I have one out that I'm doing now, which is called Second Helping, which is about losing two partners to cancer. But really, it's very hopeful and 
Uh, it's about learning how to ask for help, which is kind of, I feel like universal. That's the one that I'm working on now. But yeah, I, I did a show called Bad Habit, which was about being a nun. And my most recent comedy album was kind of set as a one person show called uh, Not the Gym Teacher. Cause okay. Because everyone always thinks I'm a gym teacher. Uh, for <laughs> When you go into a school or just in well, general? Well, when I, 10 years working at a school, I mean, I worked at the same school for 10 years, but it was a campus. So if anybody new showed up, they always assumed I was either a ninth grade boy or the gym teacher, which I mean, that's fair. I look like the gym teacher and I also look like a ninth grade boy. So fair enough. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about your, the sh- you just came back from Edinburgh. Can you talk a little bit about the show that you're, you're performing right now? Yeah, it, it's kind of a cool show because I feel like it does have, like, there are some specific parts about it. It's losing two queer partners to cancer in a row, which is, you know, a very specific experience. One I hope doesn't happen to too many people. But the real through line is about learning how to accept help and building community. So yeah, so I performed in Edinburgh for 25 days in a row. And you know, you're competing with 3,500 other shows. You know, it's got a lot of death in it. I subtitled it intentionally, Selkin Helping Two Dead Lovers Dead Funny, uh, so that people would know that there was going to be two deaths in it. Because the deaths are not the point. The point is the community, right? So it, that's a little bit of a hard sell when, you know, you're like by a drag queen on roller skates, juggling chainsaws, you know, trying to give out flyers. And I'm like, oh, we'll laugh in the face of death and also behind de- death's back. But the conversations were amazing. Like a bunch of teenagers came. I mean, I'm also not afraid to fly or teenagers because I like teenagers, but I was surprised because it's, you know, a lot of death. One group of teenagers, a group came and then two of the kids came the next day and brought their parents. And as the mom and the kid were leaving, the kid, you know, 17 or 18 said the mom was talking about something about ventilation or, you know, that kind of thing. And the kid was like, yeah, mom, you never like this whole time. I've wanted you to tell me what we should do if something happened to you, but you never want to talk about end of life stuff. And so they were like talking about it. I was like, all right, well, that's a win. doesn't matter. That's a win. So that made me really pleased. And having these conversations with people about, you know, I was reading this book. It's called You Just Have to Ask. It's a relatively new book. It's, re- it's really about asking in the workplace and really about asking in the, in the business workplace. But it said that 85% of all Americans, I don't know if this would be different for Canadians, but 85% of all Americans, well, definitely across race and across economics, identify highly or very highly with the statement I believe it's important for me to be (laughs) self-sufficient. So it's so baked into, I mean, I wouldn't even say culture. It's like, what is it baked into for it to be that universal? And so people asking for help, that is something that people struggle with so much. Like that is, I don't know if it's quite a universal, but it seems almost. And also the more conversations I have with people about learning how to ask for help or learning how to accept help, the more I, it's just like an endless thread, like trying to untangle it is just, And the thing is, is like the loneliness epidemic, right? One of the reasons we're lonely is that we aren't depending on each other. If you depend on other people, if you're in an interdependent web, that really helps a lot with loneliness. But we want to be, we want to both be totally self-sufficient. And I'm speaking for myself too, because I struggle with this. We both want to be totally self-sufficient and we want to feel like we have a web. Well, that doesn't actually work that way. And one of the things, you know, I'll say like, as queers, like, you know, in the culture wars, especially, you know, they're happening in the southern United States and stuff, the caregiving, like caregiving with just like one spouse taking care of the other is very hard on people's health. It's really hard on their emotional health and their mental health and their physical health. But, you know, one of the things that I had when both partners were dying is I had a community around me that I wasn't doing all the caregiving. As queers, we're really good at doing that since we've always made our own families. And of course, like folks I feel like folks with disabilities, especially folks in the disability justice movement, are also teaching a lot about that. This is not something I made up. This is just something we're good at. And I just feel like we are a resource. Why aren't people asking us, you know, like this kind of insistence that we all have to do it all ourselves is, I don't know, it's it's really, I, I just know the worst, some of the worst spots I've gotten myself into is because I just wouldn't let anyone help me. Yeah. And yet you're quite a helper. Like you're... Yeah. <laughs> It's like you you don't seem to have an issue giving help because it seems like you're a very giving person in all the iterations of your careers. What would you recommend to someone about if they're not good at asking for help? I don't know if you can sum it up. How would you tell someone this is how you ask for help? Well, I just made a little zine. I don't know if I have one around me. It's just like a little eight page zine about the beginning guide to asking for help. The biggest thing is you don't have to wait. Well, there's a couple of things. A, you don't have to wait till you feel like you deserve help to ask for help. 
Uh, and in fact, if you wait until you feel like you deserve it, you might never ask and you might need it, you know. So you kind of have to act as if. The other thing is to remember that people do want to help. That is, people do want to help. They do. I mean, sometimes people are tired and full of crap, but they're also, they want to help. And so you need to give people specifics if you need help, because otherwise they will do unhelpful things. Cheryl, my second partner who died, used to call it homemade chemo sock syndrome, because when she was on chemo, people kept <laughs> knitting things for her that like people who are not good at all at knitting things, you get a pair of socks that would have a, a seam so thick that it would be like walking on upside down ice skates, you know. So you got to give people specifics. And then you have to start small. You know, you ask for something tiny from somebody you know wants to do it for you. And then you can kind of scaffold. And then when I do work with folks about building caregiving teams, the biggest thing is that when you're making brownies, the bigger bowl you st- a bowl you start with, the better it's going to be, right? So reach out to your outer networks because even if you're like, okay, well, I don't want somebody who doesn't know me very well to see me when I'm in pain, right? Like, let's say you have a knee replacement. I don't want somebody who doesn't know me very well to see me uh, if I'm in pain. Well, if somebody on your outer network wants to help you, maybe they can bring food to your partner who's taking care of you or to your close friend who's taking care of you. I mean, the idea behind caregiving teams is that people are doing what they're good at and what they want to do. And, you know, of course, I mean, this is an ideal world and uh, caregiving is hard on sometimes on both really, frankly, on both people. Right. It's hard to receive care. It's hard to give care under certain circumstances. But the idea of skill matching can make a big difference. And then the other thing is we always want to wait until we really, 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 really need help to make sure that we couldn't absolutely do it ourselves. But then when we do that, and I am I have done this many times, that ends up being a little bit of an emergency because we've waited too long. And then it makes it really hard for people to help you. One final thing. Aren't you so glad you asked that question? Is that... I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> yes, I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that you will at some point get a no if you ask for help. You know, we always want to be general or indirect. You know, you can't drop a hint. People won't find it. If, but if you are specific and direct, you may get a no. But what that tells you is if somebody can tell you no, that means you can trust their yes. You know, you can trust that their, their yes is enthusiastic and they do have the capacity to give it to you. OK, I have another question. Uh, it's kind of the other side of that. You know, if you're in a position where a friend is has cancer or, you know, a friend's spouse has died, you know, people who are Clearly, they need your help, but I think sometimes we don't know what to say and we don't know what to do when we're we're watching people go through that that we love. So, how do we be good helpers to those people? Like, what what do we need to do to help them? It's funny because I just the other zine I made is also perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's called uh, grief: the first ninety days when somebody you love loses somebody they love. So, I say the biggest thing is to not. Well, not avoid the person, right? And if you're not close, close to the person, one of the things that can be really helpful to do is the same thing, is to support their inner circle. And I think this is a number one thing, is that do not say the words, let me know if I can do anything, because that puts so much onus on the person, right? So they have to, A, think of something you could do, figure out if it's something you would want to do, figure out if it's something you have the capacity to do, and then find you and then ask you. Like all those things are you can't do, especially in early grief. So sometimes what I I actually have in my, you know, in a Google Doc, a list of like 20 things that I'm good at that sometimes are helpful after grief, right? Like I'm really good at, I I can make you a nice slideshow for a funeral. And those are really specific things. Uh, I can, I'm yeah. really good at making phone calls. I'm really good at yelling at insurance companies. I'm only waiting for somebody to ask me to yell at insurance companies. And so sending people a list of like, okay, here's a list of 20 things. Are, and it, would any of those be helpful to you? Okay. That, I oh, think I that's the that. biggest one is because people... Oh, and also telling people that this offer doesn't expire. That is so helpful for me because people are so... You know, grief just... We have this like... Unfortunately, I feel like spouse and parent death is mostly used in our culture as a as a plot point to move a person into a certain space in movies, you know. And so we never really understand what grief looks like, because if we haven't seen anyone grieve with our eyes, we think it's like, I don't know, like Carrie and Sex in the City or whatever, where, you know, she's like two months later, she's like, oh, I'm all better now. I mean, they did it a little bit better than that. But, you know, for example, not much, not much better. Let's be honest. (laughs) 
so we, we don't understand how long grieving takes. So I think, you know, even putting the date of the person's death in your calendar and making sure you check up the six month, the one year, the 18 month. I found the year mark was very difficult for me because that was a time everyone's like, oh, you'll start to feel better. And I was like, it was like 300, the 365th day. And I was like, I don't feel better. I'm mad. So just telling people that this offer doesn't expire is so, so helpful, you know, if it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Well, it shouldn't. But yeah, I think sometimes even knowing what to say is, is hard. Like for me or for anyone. And I, cause you think, well, what do you say? And then people don't say anything when they're really, you, even if you said the most awkward, stupid thing, it'd be better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. And, and also I used to do a thing about like, okay, don't say this, don't say this, but like I did a blog post like that and I got like hundreds of comments where people are like, well, I know everyone else doesn't like that, but I do like that. Oh, like I used to say, like, the only thing that you can say is I'm sorry. And that sucks. Like, don't make any comparisons. Grief comparisons almost never work, even if they're very, very similar, because especially in early grief, you just can't imagine. For me, it was a little helpful to hear somebody to talk with somebody who lost a partner and to hear them say the words like, yeah, I don't remember when I started feeling better, but I must have because I feel better now, except for in moments I don't. <laughs> uh, right, right. In general, comparison doesn't help that much. And I used to tell people, do not compare the death of a human to a death of your pet. And then people get really mad. But I kind of feel like I still kind of stand by that. Not because people don't grieve as hard for pets. I, I really do believe they do. It is a little bit of a different situation. I think it's just different, you know, because... Like somebody told me after Cheryl died, they said like, oh, you know, I lost my cat Fluffy to cancer cuts the life short of it takes them away from us too soon or something like that. And I was like, well, it's not like your cat was trying to leave a legacy. Your cat wasn't like, oh, I never got to write that novel. I was going to, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I get it. You miss your cat. I mean, I have a cat that passed away two years ago that was actually Cheryl's cat. And I miss that cat every day. It's not that I don't understand that. It's just that it's a little bit of, you know. Especially like people sometimes on my Facebook feed where people have lost, as they say, fur kids, but they're talking about kids. And then I have a lot of people also on my Facebook feed who have lost human kids. That's what, that gets a little dicey, <laughs> pulling that apart. Yeah. As a veterinarian, I can. I also don't think they're the same. It, it's interesting, though. It's, it's still grief when people lose a pet. And uh, some of the research that I'm aware of is that like the pain you feel is similar, but you don't feel it for as long. Right. We. We expect, even though we kind of live in denial about it, we expect our pets, like we expect to outlive our pets, right? You don't expect to outlive your partner or maybe in some, <laughs> you wonder when that's going to happen, but you expect to be with your partner for a much longer time. So I think that's where, where it's different, but yeah. And that's tough to make that comparison. I think that would be very difficult for someone going through losing a human family member to have that compared. So I can definitely appreciate that. Yeah. And it's, it's just not helpful. Even if it, even if you think it is the same, it, it's just, it's not helpful. And, and that's not a comment on the grief. And also I do feel like there is something that's kind of like when my mom died, right? Like I felt, I love my mom, but it's also a complicated situation. Like when my cat died, it's not like my cat didn't do something for me that she was supposed to. You know what I mean? It's a very pure yeah. kind of thing. Like, <laughs> yes. Like you can yes. grieve for a way. You can grieve for an, a pet or an animal, a companion animal, in a different way than you can grieve with a complicated, you know, relationship with a human. If you're disappointed by your dog, maybe there's a bigger problem. It's true. It's pretty unconditional <laughs> with the pets. <laughs> now I want to get into like this is really heavy, but this is where you go, right? I I uh, I had the pleasure of seeing you do um, storytelling with the moth and. This is kind of your space, but I want to get into laughter at the end of the life and wherever you want to go with that. But like, how can we find humor in these really dark places, I guess, is a question, because I think you're really it's kind of a another niche, another <laughs> niche that you have. But like, it's an area that you're really good at and you teach other people how to do this. So as much as you can talk about it, how do we find laughter at the end of life? How do we find laughter in these really, really difficult moments? You know, it's interesting. I am surrounded right now by all the literature about laughter at the end of life. And there didn't used to be like when I started doing Heather was just very my first partner passed away. It was just very funny and used humor a lot. And so I just kind of started incorporating that as part of my stand up. And then people started asking me more about it and wanting me to speak about it. So then I started, you know, looking at what the literature was saying in 2007. It wasn't saying a lot, actually, um, but because 
palliative uh, care and hospice care has come into its own more as a, its own field, I feel, or specialty anyway. There's definitely a lot more literature about it. And it's really, really interesting because I was actually just reading something today. Very little of the, <laughs> the research is from the U.S., actually. But I was reading something in literature today where there was one qualitative thing where they're just coding somebody came in and was like watching interactions with patients and hospice nurses and how much humor there was. And then it was nurses in another situation. The nurses were consistently not picking up on the patient's offer of humor, right? Folks in like more of a, like maybe a, uh, like a med surge thing, but not hospice care, right? My guess is that's partly, it seems like the research says that it's partly about inexperience. You have to feel quite comfortable in your role to be able to like kind of step down a little bit and not worry about like not looking professional, right? So it might be a little bit of experience. And I also think it's time. Like you actually have to be very present to catch somebody's offer of humor. You have to be really present. That is the number one thing, right? And so I think there's many situations in which nurses simply don't have that time. But it's interesting because all the research is that patients really, really, it's important to patients. I mean, we should tell administrators it's actually, it really contributes to higher satisfaction levels, which turns into, you know, better patient surveys. But the offer of humor, right? Like the patient says something a little funny and then how the provider reacts to it is, patients use it for a lot of different reasons. They use it to maintain autonomy, to retain dignity, to build the relationship, right? And you think about it, that it does build the relationship, you know, for comfort. And I had such an interesting conversation about this the other day when I spoke to this particular conference of folks essentially doing, they do restorative justice conversations between crime victims and their perpetrators and very serious crimes, which I feel like, wow, those people really believe, I, I don't know, in restorative conversations. I don't know. It just seems like such a hard job to me. Anyway, those are often the people who are kind of the social workers present at executions as well. Two of them came up to me. And whenever I talk about laughter at the end of life, people come up to me and they want to tell me a story of something they feel slightly guilty for that they made a joke about. That is, it has never not happened. But what these folks wanted to tell me about is that every time they're present for an execution, the person about to be executed cracks jokes. Wow. And wow. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't know quite what to say to that. Like, for example, the person was saying to the nurse, you know, this was not told from the nurse, it was told by an advert observer, they're going to kill the person by lethal injection. And as they were cleaning the skin with alcohol, the prisoner's like, really, is this necessary? Like, are you worried about an infection? You're about to kill me, you know, uh, which is, first of all, a pretty good joke, I think. And also a really good point, which is probably what makes it a good joke. And it's kind of an argument against providers being mixed up in that business on many different levels. But, you know, so that's not even a normal, that's not like a hospice situation. That's, you are about to be, you know, it's not like you're dying. You're about to be killed, you know? So that's so specific. And why, what, what's the benefit of making the joke in that moment? And I was speaking to some hospice nurses the other night, and one of the people said, well, if you think about it, you only die once. So for everyone, it's a very alien experience because you've never done it before. And so there probably is something about making a joke that the emotional piece of it reminds you of a time that was not that time. And so you feel more comfortable, like it changes your emotional state. And there's definitely no research that I could find on people about to be executed cracking jokes. But that does seem consistent with some of the reasons why they do it to change their own emotional state and the emotional state of people around them. So, you know, people see it as risky and in some ways it is. And all the research says that within the context of the relationship, you know, it's, it's why, you know, hospice nurses and home nurses and, you know, nurses who are able to spend more time with folks are able to use it more effectively because the relationship is built. But it really is, you know, I use the comparison of like the, it's like playing baseball is the person is throwing you the ball, you know, the person who's ill or the family member is throwing you the ball, the humor, and your job is to catch it. Now you can decide whether you want to throw it back or not, but you can't throw it back at them harder than they threw it at you. And you can't just bat it away. 
If you bat it away, like patients will often, you know, like they know that they, they see that, right? I use the example of my boss when I was working for the school system. I got COVID early to beat the rush. I was in the ICU like March 17th, 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah. To say that, that the emergency room was bananas, it was just bananas. Uh, the head of pulmonary at NYU came in and he's like, we don't know what the fuck we're doing. And I was like, you know, it's probably okay to tell me that, but I don't know if you need to say that to everyone. And also I was like, what is, this was the beginning. Like, what's this guy going to be like in four weeks, you know? <laughs> But I texted with my sister and my boss together to tell them what was going on. And then the next text was meant just for my sister. And I wrote, uh, it's like fucking Boomer Helen here. But I accidentally sent it not just to my sister, but to my sister and my boss. So that wasn't meant as an offer of humor. But my boss immediately texted back, well, at least your sense of humor isn't sick. Or maybe it is. And that's like such a beautiful, right? Like she caught it and she just kind of lobbed it back gently. You know, she played ball with me. And I really, I mean, in addition to having a great text message that I could use in presentation, it just seemed like such a caring thing to do, you know, to be present for that moment. Because I'm sure she was uncomfortable. You know, everyone was uncomfortable those moments. And certainly somebody, you know, worked quite closely with her. You know, we didn't know who was going to live and who was going to, you know, we didn't have any idea. She didn't have any idea, but she just, she went with it with me. It's, you know, so that was like, she took the risk and it paid off. So like I, I'm just really interested in your career because you have sort of the storytelling side with the moth and then your one person shows like at, at places like Edinburgh Fringe and I think still some stand up. Yeah, I still do stand up. Yeah. But less in the clubs. Yeah. Not because it's enough. gross. Yeah. Because it's gross. OK. Yeah. <laughs> but then there's another side of you that's doing the end of life, bringing humor into end of life. And you present to healthcare providers uh, about LGBT issues, uh, gender health, and then also about burnout and compassion fatigue. And sort of how you bring storytelling and comedy into that. And as I know that's a lot of subjects, but as much as you feel comfortable, can you kind of talk about how you're using your your comedic background and training to kind of help health healthcare professionals? Yeah, I mean, so the kind of specific thing of, you know, people started asking me to speak about LGBT health like 20 years ago when I was just graduated from nursing school. And I was like, well, what makes you think I'm just like an obviously gay person? And a healthcare provider, like, I don't know if that's enough, but it was then, you know, we didn't really have, there was hardly any research. There's nothing in the peer reviewed journals, you know, and everything that had been written was really just written specifically. And this was important stuff to write about, but it was just about HIV AIDS. That was the only, it, there was a little bit of research, but it, uh, you know, it's like lesbians are all alcoholics, but all of the, all of the samples, <laughs> were, all the samples were recruited in bars. Perfect. It's like, why? That's a bad flaw. <laughs> why are there so many? <laughs> Talk about a convenience sample. Oh, like, really? Psst. Do you have a drinking problem? Um, I mean, it is true. Even now, we know that uh, the LGBT community does have a tendency to be at the ends of the bell curve, like either heavier consumers of substance or complete abstainers. You know, that's based on a sample size, not recruited just in the bars. Anyway, so there was not there. Was, so I was just kind of like, Oh, well, talk to LGBT people, you know, believe our relationships are real. Don't hit us with stick. It was very low content almost. You know, t I can remember talking about like, well, don't assume risk based on identity. Risk is based on behavior. And that being like STI risk, for example, and that being like so almost revolutionary at that moment. I remember doing that for a friend who was teaching in the physician assistant class or a physician assistant program. And she sent me the evaluations afterwards. And some of them were just homophobic, like the homophobic comments. And I was like, I can't really like I can't improve this. I do like to get I do like it when people send me evaluations because then you can, you know, improve on something or or you can, you know, enjoy the praise or whatever it is. Or it's a combination of both always. Some of them just had like this is a we shouldn't have to learn about this. And I was like, I don't need to read this. This is unnecessary. Like, don't just send me the homophobic evaluations, read them first. And so that's kind of how it started. And then at that time, I was working with the Nurse Family Partnership, and I kind of would raise my hands at trainings and be like, what about our LGBT clients? And they're like, well, these are people who are having children. We wouldn't have any lesbians having children. And I'm like, oh, yeah, really? Okay. Because <laughs> they can't. That, yeah, they can't. They can't. It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so weird. Yeah. That's so weird. I mean, it was, you know, it was 2001, but still. It, okay. Yeah. But I got kind of a reputation because of, I'm a comedian because I do have this gentle sense of humor. And, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and 
I guess I seem relatable to people or something. And also, I've talked with my conservative family a lot about it, you know. So I kind of got a little bit of this niche of like, I am the person you can bring in if you have some resistance. Yeah, I spoke at one of the one of the conferences it was actually the nurses union conference right after, you know, when Medicaid and insurance started paying for trans care in New York when that became required. You know, all of the hospitals all of a sudden were like, oh, let's all do trans surgery. You know, let's all do gender affirmation surgeries. But they really, you know, everyone saw dollar signs and they didn't really train everybody as well as they would have liked. And so I was performing at that. I was just I was really just performing and I was and I was doing a presentation about engaging your care versus LGBT patient. And I finally just turned off the slides and said, OK, well, let's just talk like, you know, people just had questions like, why did this person get so mad at me when I did this? And how am I supposed to know that? And, you know, it's 100 percent appropriate for people to ask me that question. I should be like somebody beside the patient should be the educator. It's not the fault of the nurse if they don't know. And it's also not the fault of the patient. You know, it's the fault of the system. So I'm glad to kind of step in there. You know, one of the things that I talk about is that your religion can tell you that, that it's bad for people to be gay and you can still give people great care. You don't have to have a discussion about it. You can give people great care and, you know, that you really can do it. Like that almost people have to be coached into it and, and like encouraged and inspired into it. But Good care for LGBT people is good care for everyone. Like I think about names, right? My grandmother's name was Viola. She hated that name. She went by a nickname with all the other, you know, with every adult in her life. But when she was in the hospital, they would call her Viola and she hated it. We should ask everybody what they want to be called. That's not such a hard thing. Everybody should be approached from the way of like, okay, who are your support people? Not just who are you married to? Who are your support people? Families are not statistically the leave it to beavers family doesn't exist anymore, you know, and people have wider care, you know, and this is true of all across all demographics that people have different communities and different like it's not just the nuclear family. So knowing who's asking everybody who their support people are and not just about their immediate family is important. If you can take a comprehensive sexual health, you know, assessment and history for an LGBT person, that means you can do it for anyone. We should be talking with all our patients about risks and pleasure. So yeah, I think when you approach it that way, it makes more sense for people. I mean, it would be great if everyone's like, well, I just want to do right by people because that's the right thing to do. But people are busy and tired and sometimes they're just jerks, you know. Um, so trying to make them see that this is actually, this is A, something they really can do, that you really can be inclusive in your practice. And this was, you know, like I ended up doing a training with the nurse family partnership. And this is what I was telling these, you know, these nurses, like you absolutely can make this inclusive even before our educational materials are inclusive. You absolutely can do it and you can make a difference. Oh, I love that. I, li I like the way you're framing it too, of just saying like, this is how we should treat all people. <laughs> really has nothing to do with don't treat the LGBT community differently. Just treat everyone better. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ask better questions maybe is kind of more, you know, because, yeah, there's going to be people that want their best friend there that they're not married to, but that's their best friend, you know. And so I like that way of framing things. There's a lot of burnout. Well, in all the I think all the healthcare professions, including my profession. Um, but how do you think humor can kind of come in and help help with that? There is the kind of thing of like that my caveat is always. I mean, maybe just better staffing would help more than humor. But since they're not going to do better staffing, <laughs> you know, and that's what I even say when I start, because like, if you know, somebody brings me in for nurses week. It's like, oh, you get to hear Kelly Dunham be funny. And they're like, oh, well, thanks. I would have preferred a raise, but OK. But there's actually a lot of ways, right? There's a lot of ways to intentionally add humor uh, into our lives that I talk about with folks. And there's different levels of it, right? People think like, oh, I'm not a funny person. But it's not about being a funny person. It's about recognizing funny things, right? And so just some basic things like put more physical reminders of humor around in your day. They make apps where like just a cartoon pops up every time you open your phone. Do a caption contest in the break room. Start every meeting with a knock-knock joke or end every meeting with a knock-knock joke. Just making intentional attempts to insert humor and it doesn't have to be humor you make it can be humor you curate you know that that's easier for people so that's like the biggest that's the lowest entry point and then there's things like journaling about things that you found funny 
right? And a way to do that, if things don't feel funny to you, you can break them up into the f- like four emotions. Like, okay, this happened. What was so weird about that? What was so scary about that? What made me so angry about that? And what was sad, weird, scared, angry? That's actually, that's not original to me. That's Judy Carter's way of teaching stand-up comedy. But that is a good way to generate uh, funny, like just a funny way of looking at things. Also can, can sometimes help say like, okay, if this is going to be funny to me in five years, is there any way I can make it funny now? Oh, I like that. That has been kind of the gift that stand-up comedy is to me. I feel like most of us can look back and laugh. And in fact, um, that's one of the ways that they were, when they were doing qualitative coding on laughter in, at the end of life and in palliative care and hospice care specifically, that one of the times they're the most quantitatively laughter was present was in reminiscing that even hard times looked back on often had funny stuff. And so for me, like what stand up comedy did for me is it just put me in the mindset of always looking for a way to make something funny quick for it to become funny at that moment. And, you know, and, and also both my partners, you know, being very ill and then dying and being very funny people also help that <laughs> along as well. That's almost like a mindset and, and then it also, it just helps you loosen your grip on the outcome a little bit as well, too. So those are kind of like some basic things. There's, you know, interventions, like figuring out what your sense of humor is, and then trying to front load things, like find other things that match up with your sense of humor. I know, because not everybody likes stand up. In fact, a lot of people hate stand up. Not everybody likes improv. In fact, some people hate improv. So figuring out what your sense of humor is. And you know, my mom, Love the Apple Dumpling Gang. Have you ever seen the Apple Dumpling Gang? <laughs> I kind of vaguely know who they are, but I can't. I'm having trouble placing Yeah, it's it. a Disney movie from the 70s about these kids that this guy accidentally adopts or something like that. I forget how he ends up. And it's uh, Bill Bixby who played the Hulk. Okay. Yeah. In like Little House in the Prairie costumes is like a period thing. And uh, Don Knotts and Tim Conway are in it. And the little girl is always saying, Mr. Donovan, I got to go, you know, like they're always in a stage go somewhere and she always has to pee. And then there's this huge scene with Don Knotts and Tim Conway and a fire um, ladder where they're trying to steal something. And it's just slapstick. It's easily 15 to 20 minutes of pure slapstick. Like there's no even dialogue. My mom laughed so hard every time we put that on that she would have to go to the bathroom. We called it the mom has to go video. (laughs) I wouldn't say that I enjoy slapstick. Like I, <laughs> I was reading some, some literature yesterday about how pediatric oncology patients in pre-surgery, they were bringing in clowns and that decreased the kids' anxieties. And I was like, wow, kids and adults are so different because if a clown came to me when I was about to have surgery, I think that clown would get punched. My girlfriend was like, no, you're the clown. <laughs> Anytime I've been with you before <laughs> surgery, you're the clown. <laughs> But it really is about the specifics of your sense of humor, right? Like our sense of humor all comes from our story and every story is very individual. So figuring out what makes you laugh and then finding more of it can be like kind of a fun adventure. Just made me think about if some kid was afraid of clowns. <laughs> can you imagine? Like, they could be like, why are you torturing me? Like you're already giving me chemotherapy and I'm only four years old and there's a clown here. <laughs> and I'm terrified. Yeah. I, ho- I hope they have sub- subdued clowns. Uh, yeah, I, know. I know there is this whole like people go to hospital clown school. Oh, OK. Yeah, OK. It's, thing. Yeah. it's a whole separate thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask about one more thing I found on your website because I I love the quote, but I, I really I want to dig into it more. You said that you believe that laughing is a revolutionary gesture and laughing together is the greatest revolutionary gesture of all. I just wanted I, I think that's beautiful. Um, but I just wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. That goes back to vulnerability. I mean, I don't, maybe perhaps, you know, certainly overstating it and say it's the biggest revolutionary gesture. You know, there are other revolutionary gestures. But I like the concept of a revolutionary gesture because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. But there is a moment of vulnerability when you laugh with somebody that it just changes the tenor of the room. It's a risk. You know, making a joke is a risk. And, you know, like in the way that there's kind of this, sometimes I feel like the old timey stand up comics are like, oh, I can't believe I can't. You know, you can't joke about anything anymore. And it's like, no, that's not true, actually. I think it's actually great that there's all sorts of things that we can't uh, be jerks about. That's fantastic. We can joke about plenty of things. I don't think it's a bad thing to learn how to be more sensitive. I don't. But there is a way in which anytime you make a joke, it is a risk, right? Even if you're not trying to be just like, I'm allowed to say whatever I want. 
there is a, a risk that you're going to be misunderstood. It's also a gift to reach out your hand to somebody and say like, okay, I'm going to be vulnerable in this moment. And people will laugh about things they won't, aren't ready to talk about yet. So it can create a moment of vulnerability. And then there's a moment of connection. There's a potential moment of connection. And I mean, that's the answer, right? Is the moments of connection. That's all we get, really. All right. I found you on your website. And we'll put that in the show notes. Is there other ways that you want people to connect with you? We can also put your Instagram up there. Yeah, Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. Okay, we'll get all those uh, links put into our uh, our show notes. Okay, now the last question for everyone who's on co-medicine, super important, super serious. <laughs> We're trying to get Dr. Ken Jung. You're just talking to Ken. If you could speak directly to Ken, how would you invite him to come on the show? Wouldn't you like to do a whole life review? Like not wait till you're almost dying to do it? You can do it through this podcast. See, that is a great pitch, Ken. <laughs> I hope that you'll come on the show. Okay, Kelly, I loved meeting you. I loved having you and having this amazing conversation. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of people did. You can learn more about Kelly uh, by going to her website. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This is really fun. And that wraps up another episode of Co-Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Mark Edwards, uh, who wrote the music for this podcast. He is a very funny comedian, also a musician who writes music that makes me laugh. I don't know. Is that a thing? I don't know. He can do that. Also want to shout out to Heather McPherson of Twisted Spur Media, who's our producer and editor uh, who makes everything work. I could not do this podcast without her. And I want to thank you for listening and for sticking with us in season two. Uh, if you're new to co-medicine, welcome. Uh, if you've been listening since the beginning, welcome back. Uh, it's great to have you here. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please uh, share and like and give us a review. If you didn't like it, I don't know what you're still doing here. If you didn't like this podcast, you could do nothing. Nothing would be good. <laughs>